Good morning again, my dear brothers and sisters in our Lord Jesus Christ. I don't think I've mentioned it already, but of course we bring with us the love and greetings of all of your brothers and sisters up in the Detroit Livonia Ecclesia. And I know that we've all enjoyed, our family has really enjoyed this time that we've been able to spend together this weekend. So thank you very much for having us. Well, our studies this weekend in the life of Judah have really led us to the central portion of this morning's consideration, which is the consideration of our Lord Jesus Christ. No doubt as we've looked at the life of Judah and we've seen those promises that were given in Genesis chapter 49, our minds have projected forward to the one who would truly come to fulfill these promises, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's our intent this morning to take a look at the promises that were made in Genesis chapter 49, to see how those promises were brimming with significance concerning the work of our Lord, and to take a look in Revelation chapter 5 at the Lion of the tribe of Judah, to see how we will fulfill those promises. Well, when you take a look at the Lord Jesus Christ, the connection back to those promises is unmistakable. But you could do a series of classes just taking a look at the Lord and seeing how He fulfills those promises. It's a majorly expansive topic, and so we can't really cover it at the depth of detail that we'd like to this morning. And so what we'd like to do is to really try to give an overview of it by taking a look at three palatable questions that we'd like to answer together. The first is, what is the Lion of the tribe of Judah? His characteristics and defining features as presented in the book of Revelation. How does he fulfill the terms of Genesis chapter 49? What does he do to confirm those promises that were made to Judah thousands of years before? And third, what does the Lion of the tribe of Judah mean to us? How are we to understand his work in the context of our lives as we come to consider him this morning? So let's take a look then first at what is the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Well, John is introduced in the book of Revelation to the Lion of the tribe of Judah, starting in Revelation chapter 4. And we recall that Revelation is a book of sign and symbol, as we're told in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1. And it was about things that would shortly come to pass. So from the days of John, moving forward into the future, those things that would take place concerning world events, God's people, and ultimately the kingdom. And what John sees in chapter 4 is the projection forward of where he's taken forward to the Lord's day, of where the Lord is glorified, and he's allowed to look backward in time. He's allowed to see these things as they're unfolding. And the picture of what he sees is truly awe-inspiring to behold. Because what he sees in front of him in Revelation chapter 4 is a throne, and one sitting upon the throne, and the appearance of that person is one like clear as crystal jasper stone, and a red ruby-like sardine stone, magnificent, and beautiful to behold. And all around that throne, completely encircling it, is a rainbow. And within that rainbow are the 24 elders, each one of them sitting, having a crown of gold and clothed in white. And as John beholds the majesty, the beauty of the throne, and the one on the throne, he begins to see lightning coming out of the throne. He hears the crackle of thunder, and he begins to hear voices. And John notices that in front of the throne, there are seven lamps that are burning. And as John's attention is brought to the front of the throne, he notices a sea of glass, clear as crystal. And all around the throne, so close as to almost be associated with the throne itself, are four living creatures, having a multitude of eyes in the front and the back, each of them having six wings, and each of them having a different face. The face of a man, the face of a calf, the face of a lion, and the face of an eagle. And these four living creatures begin to praise the one on the throne. And their praise then leads to the praise of all of the 24 elders that are sitting around the throne. To where now they are prostrate before the one on the throne. Having placed their crowns from off of their head in front of the one on the throne. Proclaiming his praises and how he is worthy to receive that praise. And as John watched in wonderment at what was before him, seeing the beauty of the one on the throne, seeing the magnificence of the glory, hearing the thundering, seeing the lightning, hearing the voices, seeing these creatures, everyone's attention would begin to be directed to the one on the throne. And in the right hand of the one on the throne, he would see a book. Everyone was now looking at that book when we come to the beginning of chapter 5. What was in that book? 
And John noticed that there were seven seals on the book, preventing anyone from reading what was in the book. And I believe that as John looked at this book, his mind would have gone back to Daniel chapter 12. This is the book that was sealed up until the time of the end. This is the book that Daniel had wanted to understand the contents of. But he was told, no, Daniel, it's sealed up to the time of the end. And now John was at the time of the end. Now he would have the opportunity to understand things that were sealed up and that people like Daniel had wept to understand. And so with hopeful expectation, John is looking. He's waiting. And the obvious question is asked by the angel, who is worthy to open the book, to unseal it, and to look into the contents of it? But sadly, nobody is worthy. John looks around. Surely there must be someone worthy here that can open the book, that can reveal the contents of what is inside this book. But nobody is worthy to open the book. And John begins to weep because of dismay. And having been so close to seeing the contents, it's withheld from him. But he's given these words of consolation at verse 5 from one of the elders. Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. What an introduction to the lion of the tribe of Judah. All of this pomp, all of this circumstance, all of the magnificence and the display of power that John had beheld. And now the lion of the tribe of Judah was going to open the book and reveal the contents to him. And as John lifts his tear-filled eyes with hopeful expectation of what it was that he was about to see, the lion of the tribe of Judah, he tells us what he sees in verse 6. He says, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood not a ferocious lion, but to John's amazement, a lamb with its throat cut, covered in blood. This was the lion of the tribe of Judah. And you can see the alarm in what John says. Lo, this wasn't the image that he had expected based on Genesis 49. Because this is the only other place in Scripture where the lion of the tribe of Judah comes up. And that's where John's mind must have been. You can sense the alarm as he looks at this lamb. And as he tries to comprehend how this could be the lion of the tribe of Judah. But even though it wasn't John's initial expectation, and perhaps not ours either, I think the significance and the import of this image would have begun to sink in rather quickly for John as he looked at this image. Because what he saw before him was more powerful than the king of beasts, dominating its prey and destroying its enemies. What John saw before him in the figure of the lamb is the power to defeat the greatest enemy of all. Not an enemy that's external to oneself that you can put your hand on the neck of the enemy and subdue. Because what John saw before him was the representation of the defeat of self. Self is the greatest enemy that mankind has ever faced throughout time. Self is the most ruthless and destructive thing that we will ever encounter. And this is what John saw before him, represented in the lion of the tribe of Judah. Self defeated, conquered, and slain. But this time, it's symbolized by a lamb, harmless, undefiled, and separate from sinners. Self entirely overcome, defeated, and beaten is the greatest figure of all. And that's the figure of the lion of the tribe of Judah. It wasn't going to be through the power of man. It wasn't going to be in our own strength, in the might of man to overcome self, to overcome the flesh. It was going to be in the power of God that such a victory could be attained. So what are the characteristics of the lion of the tribe of Judah? As we read through the book of Revelation and as we see these things revealed before us. Well, there's really five categories that I took a look at. And there's a handout to help encapsulate some of these things because we're going to step through them somewhat quickly. But there's the physical characteristics. There's the moral characteristics. There's the lineal characteristics of where he comes from. There's the status. And then there's also the provisional characteristics of the lion of the tribe of Judah. So we've already considered briefly 
the appearance of the lion, the physical characteristics, that it's a lamb with its throat cut, seven horns, seven eyes, with the seven spirits of God, all-powerful, all-seeing, and all-knowing, that no one can stand before the wrath of the lamb, is what we're told in chapter 6. When it comes to the moral qualities of the lamb, we find that he's worthy to receive glory, praise, and honor. This worthiness comes from the moral qualities that have been exhibited. That he's worthy to open the book with the seals in Revelation chapter 5. And he's the conqueror of the beast, represented of sin and the defeat of it. When we take a look at his lineal descent, we know that he's the root of David from what we just read here in Revelation chapter 5. And we know from Revelation 22 that he's the offspring of David. You take a look at the status of the Lamb. That he's the king upon the throne. The elders and the beasts, all are subject on their faces, both saints and non-saints. Those who have accepted him and those who not, but those who have not are all made subject to the Lamb. He's the center of God's plan as the one in the midst of the throne. He's the commander of God's army, the bridegroom of the saints, the foundation of New Jerusalem, and the ruler of the age to come. But it's not just power, it's not just might of himself, but there are provisional characteristics that come along with the Lamb, that others through great tribulation are able to wash themselves in the blood of the Lamb, that they can make their robes white, that they can become righteous and be forgiven through what he has accomplished. And he feeds others, leading them to living waters, and he ushers in a time when sorrows are gone, and he inspires and provides strength for other people to overcome the flesh. That is not just bringing salvation for himself, but through what he's accomplished, he creates a pathway whereby others can come and follow in like manner to be saved. I'd like to go to the answering of that second question. After we've defined here what the Lion of the tribe of Judah is, to see briefly how he fulfills some of these promises that were made in Genesis chapter 49. If you could just turn back there briefly for a moment. Back in Genesis chapter 49. Yesterday we looked at how Jacob defined the characteristics of his son how he saw in his son Judah the aspects of the lion. And we saw the three different phases of the young lion, of the lion as he grows older, and then as the old lion in, in providing for the young. And we see all three of those aspects brought up as well. The health and vigor, the dominion of the lion of the tribe of Judah, and the protection and provision for the young. In regards to the health and vigor that are brought up here in Genesis chapter 49, of that young lion that's spoken of, we know that there's no hunger or thirst associated with the lion of the tribe of Judah from Revelation chapter 7. That rivers of water flow out of the throne of the Lamb, and they're used for the healing of the nations. This health and vigor that's available through the Lamb of God. As far as dominion goes, all people are on their face before Him. No one can stand before His wrath. Who can rouse up the Lamb of God? Just like who will rouse up Judah in Genesis 49. And He has seven horns. Horns representing power in Scripture. Complete power to assert the will of God and to make sure that it's enforced. And He has this provision or this protection for the young in cleansing others from their sins, in feeding and leading to living waters, and in providing strength for others to overcome the flesh. And so each one of those phases of Judah's life, of the young lion, of the lion's whelp, and of the old or the mature lion, each one of these is seen in the work of the lion of the tribe of Judah. And if you take a look at chapter 49 and verse 11, at what it says here about What's going to happen? Binding his foal unto the vine, and his ass's colt unto the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine, and his clothes in the blood of grapes. In the second half of this verse, of where it talks about washing his garments in wine, sometimes we think about him treading the wine press, like in Isaiah 63, and that his garments become splattered with the blood of, as he goes out in victory. But that's not what this is talking about here. 
This is the washing of his garments with blood. This is the power of a precious life to bring about life for others. It goes on to talk in verse 12 of his eyes shall be red with wine and his teeth white with milk. And we know from Isaiah 55 of what wine and milk represent, of how we see the doctrines and the truth of God contained within this symbol here in Genesis 49 and verse 12, and how Christ is so filled with the doctrines and the truth of God that they are exuded in his physical appearance in what can be seen, so much so that we know that our Lord Jesus Christ is called the Word of God. It's not the pomp and circumstance that would naturally come to mind with such an individual, but this image is being presented to us for a very specific reason. When I studied Genesis chapter 49, and I looked at all the characteristics that Jacob brought up about his son Judah, all the characteristics of the lion, this lamb was the farthest thing from my mind of what I would expect to see in the lion of the tribe of Judah. And it's this contrast because God wants us to stop. God wants us to reflect on what it truly means to each one of us. It was startling to John, and it's startling to us to think about this lamb with its throat cut, resurrected from the dead. And this image, even though it is stark, and even though it's different than what we would expect, will stick with us as we move forward from this point to considering our Lord through the emblems. Because in this very humble image is an extremely powerful lesson, isn't there, brothers and sisters? That our elevation will only come in like manner. That our elevation will only come through the denial of self and the following in His footsteps. Because when you look at the end of Romans chapter 8, at all the things that can separate us from the love of Christ and how Paul's going to great pains to tell the Romans, nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. The one thing that's not mentioned in that list is self. Because we ourselves are the only things that can separate us from the love of Christ. And at different points in our own spiritual journeys, the realization of this fact is brought crashing home with sledgehammer force as we look at ourselves and we realize that there's major things that we need to do to improve, to be more like our Heavenly Father and more like His Son. And we're led to the point that Paul was led to in Romans chapter 7, of where he says, the things that I want to do, those are the things that I don't do. And the things that I don't do, want to do, those are the things that I do. And he's led to just exclaim in frustration, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And he goes on to thank God through Jesus Christ, his Lord, who has made that pathway available to make up for his own deficiencies and to count him as righteous despite his wickedness. And it's at this point that we recognize the power of the Lion of the tribe of Judah and what it means for us and its application. Turn back, if you would, to Revelation chapter 1 and take a look at verse 5 as we see what it is that the Lord Jesus Christ accomplishes for those who are His. That's Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5, where the Lord Jesus Christ is introducing this message that He's delivering to John. It says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, Unto him that hath loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And then just a couple pages over in the reading that we read this morning, in Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 and 10, we see very similar words here about the real way that the Lord's work will impact our lives. It says there in Revelation 5 and verse 9, And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book, and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood, out of every kindred, and tongue, and people, and nation. And hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. This is a wonderful vision, a wonderful hope for all of us who are suffering through trial and adversity. All of us who feel the hand of God very heavy in our lives knowing that it is for a reason, that it is for a purpose. And what you note over and over again is that the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Lamb of God, has provided a means for reconciliation for each and every one of us. An opportunity to rid ourselves, to be ridden 
Because it's not ridding ourselves, it's being ridden of this death-ridden nature and to put on new garments of immortality and beauty to the glory of our Heavenly Father. But as we've seen in the journey of Judah, this elevation doesn't come through the promotion of self. Judah struggled with this throughout a large portion of his life. Where even when he was in the Ecclesia, he didn't grasp it. He was spiritually lost. And we can be the same. Or we can be like Judah, lost outside the Ecclesia, thinking that there's something better, something that's going to bring us lasting joy in this life. But regardless of where we stand, the point is crystal clear for us that we need to be stepping back and asking ourselves the difficult question to figure out what it is that truly motivates us in life, to really reflect and to be introspective. What is it that motivates us in life? And it's a very difficult question to answer because our hearts are very deceitful and desperately wicked. And they deceive us, even ourselves, that we don't even know sometimes why we do the things that we do. We like to think that we do, but we need to step back and reflect and see what God is bringing into our lives. Because a lot of times the way that we respond to what God brings into our life inadvertently reveals to us where we are at in relation to our Heavenly Father. We can't step back and say, well, that's not me. I didn't mean to do that. That's not really reflective of where I'm at. But we need to take stock of when things happen and what those things are revealing about us. Because when God reveals to us that we have a major thing that we need to work on in our lives, or He shows us a character flaw, it's not a matter of stepping back and becoming discouraged and judging ourselves unworthy. Because none of us are worthy. It's a matter of being thankful for the fact that God has revealed to us something that we need to improve on while there still is time to make that change. While there still is an opportunity, where there's life, there's hope. And we saw, as we did, didn't we, yesterday in Genesis 49, of where despite all of the failings in Judah's life, leading him up to that point, that not one of them was brought up. Only positive things were mentioned to Judah. And that's not something that's exclusive for Judah. That's something that's available for each and every one of us, despite our many failings, that God will look past those things as though they don't exist. Separating the East from the West, that's the same way that He will view us if we, in like manner, try to be transformed based on the things that He's bringing into our lives. If we try to take the learnings from the journey of Judah and make them real for ourselves. And so we press on each and every week, remembering the work of our Lord and the conquering of the flesh and providing a pathway of reconciliation for each and every one of us. And as we now transition to the table of remembrance, let's read just one more set of verses in Revelation chapter 7 to think forward to the day of when we will truly be ridden of this flesh that we now possess, to try to make this vision of the kingdom real for ourselves and to see what it is that exists for those who follow in the Lord's footsteps. That's Revelation chapter 7, verses 13 to 17. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. It's a wonderful vision of the kingdom, isn't it? And yes, it will be through much tribulation that we will enter into the kingdom of our Lord. But what a wonderful vision to help us press through the present time to see beyond the temporal, and to look to the eternal. Even so, come Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all.